The Orphans of Symmetra. Chapter 3. Mina, radiant, came to find her brother. Porphyrus. Good news. Papa is willing. Porphyrus opened his eyes very wide. You're sure? Mother and Papa Christopher have been talking it over. Papa was a bit reluctant at first, but in the end he gave in. You can have it when you like. Oh, Mina. Truly. His face lit up. In spite of the pain on his arm, still sharp enough to be uncomfortable, he started jigging about for joy. Then, sighs with sudden doubt, for it was too good to be true, he said is it really sure? As sure as your arm getting broken by a car on the high road. Papa has even asked Mother whether she can find a dressmaker in Simitra. That clinched it. It was true. Porphyrus began jumping up and down again, without a thought for his broken arm. You see, Mina, my nails did help, after all. For two days, Porphyrus buzzed around his mother like a bee around a grape, until she finally agreed to take him to Simitra. Mina, of course, accompanied them. It was October now, one of the most beautiful most beautiful months of the year in Greece, for the height of summer, cast shadows that were subtler and purer than at any other time. Porphyrus, momentarily forgetting the reason for their journey to the village, said to the sister no wonder so many foreigners come here, it's the most beautiful country in the world. The most beautiful country in the world. Repeated Mina, who, like Porphyrus, had never seen any other. They were walking along together hand in hand, ahead of their mother, to force her to hurry, but when they reached the summit of a steep cedar-lined slope that twisted and turned as it plunged down into Simitra, they came to a sudden halt. There, Mina see. That's the very place I didn't realize the car was so near I couldn't remember where I was anymore. If only you'd seen those great eyes rushing at me I didn't even have time to feel afraid. This was the first time he had passed the spot since the accident his injury had kept him at home for a long time. Well, we did said the little girl. We were terribly afraid. Then they brought you home, you looked whiter than goat's milk. Pooh! said Porphyrus, in a nonchalant sort of way. Women always get upset for no reason at all. As it's turned out, everything's absolutely wonderful. He had already forgotten how he had howled like a banshee when his arm was set how for thirty-five days he had groused and grumbled about it being imprisoned in a plaster cast. All that belonged to the past. Porphyrus was one of those happy souls who only remember pleasant things. In this case, the pleasant thing was his luck in being hit by such a fine car. He might so easily have been run over by some smuggler gold jalopy that drove on without stopping. The occupants of this car were well-to-do business folk from the plain of Thessaly. They were so shattered by the accident they had brought about that, although they were not wholly responsible for it, they had paid compensation to Porphyrus' parents. For those poverty-stricken parents living on the barren soil in Epirus, the amount represented a tidy sum. So Porphyrus, as soon as he was well again, had once more put forward the famous gasoline pump project. His mother would obviously have preferred to use the money on repairing of the house, since it was falling to bits but Papa Christopher was just as eager as his son to have a gasoline pump. He was much less enthusiastic, though, when Porphyrus, timidly at first and then with increasing insistence, started talking about certain red overalls seen in front of the service station in Janina. Look here, Porphyrus, you don't really want to look like a scarecrow. But, Papa Christopher, since at Janina we're not in Janina, Porphyrus, and red attracts frogs, not cars, Whenever his father became ironic, it was better to give up. But Porphyrus was incapable of really yielding. Since no one had ever got anything from Papa Christopher by frontal attack, he must persuade his mother to help him, and, still more important, Mina, who seemed able to coax her father into anything by gently kissing his cheek and in effect Mina had won the battle. So he was in fact going to have the red uniform of a tip-top garage hand. It was a wonderful world and Greece was a beautiful country. You'll see he said to Mina they walked on again. I'll look so magnificent you won't know me and even Papa won't he dare tease me. They came to the village, with its old white stone and discolored roofs. At last, after a long search in the alleys and side streets, they climbed the stairway on which great thick leaf plants grew in stone jars. This was the dressmaker's house. Porphyrus made a face, he would have preferred an expensive shop. Bales of cloth were piled on shelves. The dressmaker showed them everything she had. 
none of the material was scarlet enough to suit Porphyra's. Soon the table and the tiled floor were strewn with cloth, but he only shook his head. The dressmaker finally managed to discover, at the back of a cupboard, an odd length of so vivid the color that it hit you in the eye like a sunburst. That's the one. That's it. Yelled Porphyra's in delight. It was a remnant left over from the time when soldiers of the Greek army wore short scarlet coats. The dressmaker pointed out that the cloth was half eaten by months, and that it would be extremely difficult to fill in all the holes. That's the one. That's it. Was all Porphyra's would say. Mina approved she never had any doubts about her brother's excellent taste. The dressmaker unrolled the short remnant. Unfortunately there was not enough for a whole uniform with a cap as well. I could make you the tunic and trousers, said the dressmaker, but not the cap, or the cap but not the trousers. Cruel dilemma. Porphyrus thought it over. Which was the more important? In his mind's eye he saw, one after the other, the soldier, the mailman, the station master, and a policeman. There was no doubt at all that the cap made the man. He asked for the cap, and Mina approved his choice. The dressmaker began to take his measurements. One week later, Porphyrus brought his uniform home in triumph. All the family were called together to see him parading in front of the mirror in the kitchen, in spite of his slight apprehension in case Papa Christopher should tease. But his father only smiled, so Porphyrus was able to abandon himself wholeheartedly to his delight. 